Everyone settle down because, yes, we're doing it. Is it a work? Is it a shoot? Is it a woot? We'll never know, even though we always find out. What? Don't know. However, the work shoot is something that wrestling companies have done a lot to differing success. So, I'm Sam from What Culture. Please do hit that subscribe button. It'll make you feel good. And this is the 10 most elaborate works in wrestling history. Number 10, Brock Lesnar pulverizes Randy Orton. Never forget that if he wanted to, Brock Lesnar could destroy everybody in WWE for real. I could even go as far to say that there are few more legit warriors in history than Brock, which is why at SummerSlam 2016, the Beast was told to smash Randy Orton's head in the hard way and bust him open. Yep. This even tied into the finish as Lesnar was awarded a TKO victory and this looked so real, other wrestlers thought Brock had just decided to do this because why the flub not? Chris Jericho even confronted him afterwards in rage that he had just ignored the code and was taking liberties. It turned out he hadn't. This was all pre-planned and Vince McMahon and Triple H had to break these two up as somebody shouted, it's a work. Now it seems to me that maybe we shouldn't be beating people up so badly you scare the locker room half to death. But what do I know? can't even grow hair. Number 9, Jeff Jarrett attacks a fan. But at TNA Slammiversary 2005, Jarrett was all ready to take on AJ Styles in the King of the Mountain match, along with about 45 other people. Before the pay-per-view went live though, which is where this gets really interesting, Jeff was at ringside when a masked audience member insulted him, so Double J told him to get in the squared circle. As they did do this, Jarrett kicked the crap out of him, leaving Jeff to be arrested and missed the main event. Some will still tell you this was the real deal, but the dude was Sal Ren a wrestler who after the fact competed for the likes of Ring of Honor and the NWA. It also handily meant Jarrett was out the way so Raven could return and win the world title. So it was an elaborate work, although you can't fault TNA. They did it. People still think this was a serious situation. Number eight, the outsiders arrive in WCW. When Scott Hall turned up on Nitro on the 27th of May 1996 and acted like he had broken into the building, it was just awesome. It got even better two weeks later because Kevin Nash then turned up and it really felt like Razor Ramon and Diesel had broken ranks and decided to kick WCW's ass. And sure, after a short while, it was obvious they were on the payroll, but that didn't matter. We planted that seed and we're gonna let it grow. Even them using their real names was cool because people didn't do that in the mid 90s. Everyone had to have some ridiculous title like Duke the Dumpster Drozzy, and yet here were two guys just being themselves blurred the lines perfectly. The commentary team added to this as well by shouting things like, they're not meant to be here, and even refusing to mention them by name. And it sparked a huge ball of nonsense as the WWF then started to act like Diesel and Razor were coming back. It caused such commotion, Hall and Nash got more money from WCW, which was hilarious as Vince McMahon was just throwing his copyright muscle around and was about to bring back fake versions of these characters. So yes, this means world champs in wrestling worked themselves into a shoot couldn't make it up. Number seven, the return of Matt Hardy. I never really want a story to be born out of an affair, but hey ho, in 2005, this is what we got. Because yes, in what is a heart-wrenching tale, Matt Hardy found out that his girlfriend Lita had been cheating on him with best friend Edge. My word. This was like something from a soap opera, and understandably, Matt was so broken, ironically, he went online to let loose. WWE didn't like that, so he was let go. Damn. As you can imagine, the fan base thought that was BS and started to make noise about this at every show. Edge got booed, Hardy chants rang out in all of the arenas, and two months later, this was all switched around as Matt was hired back. Madness. At that point, it was obvious they'd come to an agreement, but in the interim, Hardy was still turning up on programs unannounced, grabbing the microphone and shouting things like, Ring of Honor into it. This was enough to convince some people that maybe he had lost it. Who could blame him? To be fair, this was a great way to play off a real-life situation and make it wrestling. Although their first match still irks me. The cheater beat the cheatee so badly, the referee had to stop the thing. I'm pretty sure it should have been the other way around. Number six, the end of WCW Hulk Hogan. Remember that tweet everybody still laughs about from Hulk Hogan when he went on about not working yourself into a shoot, brother? Well, he should know about this because he did it in 2000. Happening at WCW's Bash at the Beach, the idea to begin with was dumb. Hulk defeated Jeff Jarrett for the WCW World title after Jeff laid down for Hogan because he thought this whole situation was crap, behind the scenes. Vince Russo was involved too and the Hulkster yelled at him before storming off. But later in the show, Russo cut his own promo and when Hulk heard this, he wasn't happy. He decided Vince had gone too far, sued the company and never returned. Yes, that is how it all ended. Unsurprisingly, WCW would be out of business eight months later and it was due to stupid things like this. No one understood what was going on and casual fans must have felt like they'd been slapped. It was so non-inclusive, it was ridiculous. I swear they forgot the first and foremost thing about wrestling 
is it's meant to be fun. Number five, MJF versus AEW. This one is still going on now as I speak, and man, they have done a good job. In 2022, the kayfabe line has been blurred, and no one knows what the hell is going on. It's been a very well executed plan, or maybe it's real, I've no clue. In terms of what we've seen on TV, MGF is furious that he's been overlooked due to the influx of ex-WWE talent, so much so he no-showed a meet and greet, and almost missed his match with Wardlow at Double or Nothing. Even before then, there were rumblings that he was unhappy over money and that come 2024, when his contract expired, he'd be more than happy to speak to WWE. As of right now, Maxwell's merchandise has been pulled and it's not even on the website. Ultimately, who cares because this has become the talk of the town and underlines exactly what wrestling is, what makes it so compelling anyway. Number four, the Russian nightmare Nikita Koloff. Nikita Koloff was an excellent heel. A brutal Russian grappler, he is an example of how to book a bad guy and from the moment he was introduced in 1984, everybody bored him as a monster mostly because that's how he was presented. He only ever spoke in Russian, which American audiences hated in the 80s due to the ongoing Cold War, and he fought everyone. Dusty Rhodes, Magnum Thierry, Ric Flair, Sting. Throughout all of that, he never let his foreign stance go either, even outside the show. And yet in reality, this man was Nelson Scott Simpson from Minnesota. <laughs> Amazing. Nelson was just so committed to the work, he changed his name to Nikita Koloff so nobody could figure it out, and he learned Russian to get this across. If you want to say this is next level stuff, you'd be right, because for years fans thought he was from the East, even if they knew wrestling was predetermined. That's where sports entertainment is at its best too. You know the deal and are super smart, and yet you're still just a tiny bit unsure more power to this guy. Number three, the first summer of punk. Let's chat it about for obvious reasons. CM Punk's reign of terror as Ring of Honor champion in 2005 is a work of art. Stepping into how the internet worked, it came out that Punk had signed with WWE just as CM was preparing to fight Austin Aries for the Ring of Honor world title. This was at Death by Dishonor 3, so everybody assumed Punk was going to lose, and given how awesome he'd been for the promotion, fans treated him like an outgoing hero. We then used all of that for the ultimate swerve, however, because not only did Punk win the belt, he then cut a promo on the fans and turned heel. This is flubbing great. It totally took everybody off guard behind the scenes. CM had got on WWE to agree he could finish off his Ring of Honor work. But this gave us two months of madness. You really have to see it. Eventually, he would drop the title to James Gibson before moving on. This is how you make the jump. The ultimate transition. Number two, everything Jerry Lawler and Andy Kaufman. Superb this, even years later. You can argue that it's never been topped. In fact, Jerry Lawler and Andy Kaufman were so dedicated to this whole thing, it was only after the comedian's death that it was revealed it had been a work. Incredible. Starting as Andy had been a lifelong wrestling fan and wanted to get involved, he declared himself the intergender champion and started beating up women and acting like he was the king. Eventually, Lawler took offense to that, obviously, who decided to smash Kaufman with a pile driver, which broke his neck. Whoops. The taxi star sold this perfectly as he would go everywhere in a neck brace, with all this peaking on the 1982 David Letterman show where they just went off. F-bombs, thrown coffee, massive slaps. Even Letterman thought they had lost their tempers. It's quite the thing to see. You need to go and watch all of this if you haven't because the pair basically tricked the world. And sure, it was easier to do that 40 years ago, but still... As silly as it sounds, this was art. Number one, the loose cannon. If we are talking about working in the entire wrestling business, nobody beats Brian Pillman. And I mean no one. Starting towards the end of 95, when Pillman had been brought into the Four Horsemen, the dude just started acting like a madman. He began blurring the lines even without permission, such as calling Kevin Sullivan the WCW booker live on air. When he was fired in 1996, people thought something was up. They were right. While we didn't know it at the time, Brian had convinced Eric Bischoff to give him his release so he could run amok on the indies before coming back a bigger star. All of this had to be legit so nobody would know otherwise. And while Pillman did go to ECW, he also used this to convince the WWF to give him more money, and he went there instead. <laughs> this guy. Know of any other elaborate works in wrestling history? Make sure you let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Then head over to whatculture.com where you can read articles like this with your eyes. Make sure you follow us on social media at WhatCultureWWE or at Simon316. And we do have other videos I checked. And one of them is just for you. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me as always. And as I've asked before, and as I'll ask again, did I record this in my pants? Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. Or maybe it's a work shoot. I didn't make any sense. <laughs>